Everything you need is going to be in the Book of Alternative Services and in your Bible. Uh, if you don't have a Book of Alternative Services, you can find a link to that in the description of the video be below this video. I'll start with a moment of silence, and then we will turn to page 45. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Page 98. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He gave us new life and hope by raising Jesus from the dead. Rejoice then, even in your distress. We shall be counted worthy when Christ appears. God has claimed us as his own. He called us from our darkness into the light of his day. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. On page 48, sentence 10. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship. Christ our Passover on page 50. Alleluia! Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. 
Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. O come, let us worship. Our first reading today is from Acts. Often during Easter, between Easter and Pentecost, we have an Acts reading in place of our usual Old Testament reading. So the reading today is from Acts chapter 9, 36 to 43. Acts 9, 36 to 43. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples hearing that Peter was there sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then, calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 23 which is found on page 731 in the Book of Alternative Services. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading is from Revelation, chapter 7 verses 9 to 17. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 17. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving 
and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is from John chapter 10, verses 22 to 30. John 10, verses 22 to 30. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I am the Father are one. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask that we would understand your truth, that your truth would be buried deep in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the Bible, the image of the shepherd is used to refer to leaders in general, um, often to kings and also to God. So when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep in John 10. And my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. He is leaning on that cultural understanding of what shepherd, spiritually, politically, pastorally, is referring to. He's claiming to be at least a king. (laughs) which is what it means to be Messiah. But there's also, God is also called shepherd as well, so there's a little hint of that there as well. The image of the shepherd has become much loved for Christians to refer to Jesus. We see this right in Peter's first letter, where he says, You are going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. And he also says, And when the chief shepherd appears you will win the crown of glory that never fades away. So this is 1 Peter 2, and chapter 2 and chapter 5. We also see this happening in our reading from Revelation, where we read, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life. This is Revelation 7, obviously. So when Christians look back through Scripture, like to to Psalm 23 and read, the Lord is my shepherd, it was natural for them to read this as referring to Jesus, or at least within their experience, reading it as referring to Jesus. 
And this was not just kind of a, a literary reality, but it was their spiritual experience of their relationship with Jesus, who Jesus was to them, what Jesus had done for them. They saw him as their shepherd. Psalm 23 begins famously, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this is a kind of a thesis statement of this psalm. It represents and encompasses the whole psalm, really. Um, The the rest of the psalm is really just unpacking that statement. The needs of the sheep are taken care of. They want for nothing, is is what it's saying. And there's an insightful bit in one of the Harry Potter novels. I think it's the very first book. So Harry Potter discovers a magical mirror. Uh, It's called the Mirror of Erised. And when Harry looks into it, being an orphan, he sees his parents with him. But when his friend Ron looks at it, he sees himself as a great athlete or the head boy of his his, uh, particular part of the school. And they're trying to figure out what this mirror is about. He's like, well, it can't be showing the future because, well, for Ron, it was showing, he thought, maybe the future because, but how can that be the future for Harry because it's showing his parents who had died. So they're trying to figure out what this means. So the, the wizard, Dumbledore, who's very wise, gives him a hint. He says that the happiest person in the world would look into the mirror and see themselves just as they are. The mirror shows the deep desires of a person's soul. The insight is that the happiest person is content with their life as it is. They aren't plagued by regrets, things that they wanted to change, things that haunt them from their past, nor are they craving something to happen to them in the future. They are able to live in the moment content with the life they have. St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Jesuits, wrote about something he called holy indifference, or we translate it as holy indifference. And he wrote this in his spiritual exercises, which he's famous for, as well as uh, founding the Jesuits. He taught that holy indifference means to not be overly attached. This was important because when we resist God's will for us, it's often because we're attached to something more than we're attached to wanting to do God's will. So think of the rich young ruler who walked away from Jesus because Jesus asked him to give away all he had to the poor and follow him. His attachment to his wealth got in the way of following Jesus. Holy indifference doesn't mean emptying the bank account. It it means holding it all with an open hand. Gently. This isn't about complete detachment and living in a cave somewhere. <laughs> it, means to, it means living detached enough from things, f- from experiences, f- even from people, to either hold them or leave them depending on how they help you serve God. Holy indifference means that you are content to serve God in wealth or in poverty. You are indifferent to which of those you are called into. Whatever situation you find yourself in, you are content that God would not have placed you in that circumstance if it wasn't the right place for you to serve God. You are indifferent to the circumstances that life gives you, knowing that God has placed you in a place where we, and given you the resources to be able to serve him and love him. And that means that we strive to be content in singleness or in marriage, uh, as parents or without children, in wealth or in poverty, in health and physical comfort or in discomfort and disease. Whatever our circumstances, God has given us the resources to be able to love him and serve him and to become more like Jesus in those particular circumstances. So we don't have to be attached to those particular circumstances, thinking one is better than the other for us to be able to serve God in. So in a spiritual sense, this is to be without want. We know that our good shepherd watches over us, so how could our shepherd not provide us with what we need? 
Ignatius teaches us to assume that we have been taken care of, that everything we ultimately need is before us. It has been given to us. But we have to recognize that our ultimate need is not to be comfortable. Our ultimate need is to love and serve God and in doing that to be shaped more and more into the image of Christ. So we assume that whatever discomfort we face has been allowed so that we can learn to love God learn to serve God, and to become more like Christ. And this can be very hard to hear, and I know that. It's, it's even harder to live. And I know I'm saying it like it's an easy thing, and I'm, I don't, I'm sorry that it, if, if you hear it that way. I know it's not an easy thing in our world where we face so much suffering and so much injustice but I believe it is also where the saints have taught us to strive, to, to strive to live that way. I believe that's what they're trying to teach us. So this Psalm, Psalm 23, is an antidote to fear if we really believe what it is saying. If our shepherd really is looking after us, we don't have to be afraid. And this is something we hear repeated over and over in the Bible. God says to Abraham, do not be afraid. I am your shield in Genesis 15.1. To Isaac, God says, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you in Genesis 26.24. Moses says to the people, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, an army larger than your own, your own you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy 21, 20, verse 1. And again, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. The prophet Isaiah says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, do not fear, I will help you. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. This is Isaiah 41.10, 41.13, and 43.5. So, and there's many other places, right? This is a constant refrain from the Bible. Do not be afraid. God is with you. Do not be afraid. I am with you. It's important to also see that this doesn't mean the people of God never face hardship. They had reasons to be afraid. They were told not to be afraid because they were facing circumstances that naturally made human beings afraid. So, You don't tell people who aren't already afraid to not be afraid. They are afraid because they're facing circumstances that make human beings afraid. The reason they are not to be afraid is because God is with them. So when God is telling us to not be afraid, it doesn't mean that we won't face challenging circumstances. It is almost certain, maybe it is certain, that we will face challenges that will tempt us to be afraid. In our psalm, we read about walking through the darkest valley, or the valley of the shadow of death. And then we read about being in the presence of enemies. The presence of our shepherd doesn't mean that we won't face enemies and we won't walk through those dark valleys. We will face difficulty. But when we know our shepherd is with us, we don't have, these don't have to be terrifying experiences. We read, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is verses 4 to 5 in in Psalm 23. So we are given these passages to read shortly after Easter because At Easter, we remember that Christ conquered sin and death. In an ultimate sense, what do we have to be afraid of? 
if ultimately death and, east and sin have been conquered at Easter, what do we have to be, have to be afraid of? And I, I know it sounds like I'm minimizing people's pain, and I'm sorry if you feel that way. But this, if this is really true, that Christ has conquered sin and death, that means that we can say with Paul in Romans 8, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed in us. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is hard to hear, I think, because we are surrounded by voices that are trying to profit from our fear. You know, watch the news, and it is full of fear. Fear of violence, fear of criminality, fear of even our own citizens who might disagree with us. There are all kinds of voices in our culture right now that are trying to pump you full of fear. And no wonder we have an anxiety problem that is just an epidemic within our society. And so we have to drown out those voices with scripture that tells us, do not be afraid, I am with you. Watching the news and, and paying attention to these other voices, it's like a liturgy. And it gets into your heart, it gets into your soul, and it teaches you to be afraid. But what if we truly don't have to be afraid? What if we don't have to live in fear? What if you really don't have to fear death because your shepherd will guide you through that dark valley? What if you really don't have to fear enemies because even if they killed you, you would be with your shepherd? What if you really didn't have to fear any man or woman or creature? What if we really don't have to fear any circumstances that life throws at us? What if we don't have to fear any of that because God can use it to some ultimate good? Which doesn't mean God does bad things to us but it means God can transform those bad things that happened to us into something beautiful. Like the cross was transformed into resurrection. Maybe the bad things that life throws at us can be transformed in that same way. What if our shepherd really is with us, guiding us, supplying us with all we need to love and serve God so that we can grow more into the image of Christ? Dare we believe that that is true? May God help us believe this, not just in our heads, but in our hearts as well, so that we can live it. Amen. We'll take a moment to consider what God is saying to us through those readings, and then we will turn to page 52 for the Apostles' Creed. Let's take a moment to hear what God is saying.
page 52. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. During the prayers, I'll leave spaces for you to bring forward your own concerns to God. In joy and hope, let us pray to the source of all life, saying, Hear us, Lord of glory. That our risen Savior may fill us with the joy of his holy and life-giving resurrection, let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. that isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the Easter Gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. that he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. Provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. by his power, wars and famine may cease through all the earth. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. that he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, and the dying, that they may be comforted and strengthened. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. He may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. 
Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. O oh God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On page 54, we praise our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thank you for joining me for a morning prayer on this, the third Sunday after Easter.